you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4 and go to verse 11. As you're turning there, I'll just give you a quick recap. We just finished our 17-week study on the book of John last week. And one of the big things that we took away when we left that book was John's desire to get us to understand who Jesus was. That was a big reason why he wrote. But also so that our belief in him will change our hearts. So it's kind of with that same desire about wanting people to see the beauty of Jesus, that we take this turn into a new message series. So before we get into any of that, let's read Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to pick up in the verse 11, and I'm going to read through 16. This is Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. He says this, He gave, being Jesus, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Now, aside from that being an unbelievably long run-on sentence, What Paul is trying to get us to understand is a couple main points. First and foremost is that Jesus gave his church gifts in the form of people. He gave them apostles, he gave them prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And these gifts that he gave to the church, the purpose of their role, what they're supposed to be doing, is equipping the church for the work of ministry and also maturing in our Stature of Christ. So God gave gifts to do a thing so that something will happen. I am a pastor teacher. One of my roles as a pastor at this church is to help equip you as the saints to do the work of the ministry, but also help you mature in a discipleship process so that you can grow in your relationship with the Lord. Does that make sense? That's what Paul's trying to get ahead. So he says, I'll go ahead and finish up to, uh, through the rest of this. He says, rather speaking the truth in love, so that's one of the things we're supposed to be doing, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint which is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So in this process of these people who are the gifts, equipping the church and helping them grow, the church is resp- excuse me, responding to these gifts so that they grow and they mature. And one of the marks of maturity within a church is the, the ability to be able to speak in a loving and compassionate manner to each other and the world, people who are not Christians. You tracking with me? That's what, Jesus, that's what Paul was trying to get us to understand was one of the main goals of what Jesus told us to do. Now, we're starting this new message series today called The Age of Skeptics. And the reason why we're doing this is because I want to be able to, as the pastor of this church, help equip you to accomplish the task task that Jesus gave all of us when he was talking to his disciples in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, when he gave the Great Commission. He told his disciples, and that responsibility that fell on their shoulders falls onto every Christian who becomes a Christian to go out and preach the gospel into all of the areas of the world. You preach the gospel with the way that you live by letting the kingdom of God change your life. And that puts the kingdom of God on display by the way that you live. But you also use your mouth in having conversations with people who are not followers of Jesus. That is a thing that all Christians are supposed to do. You don't get a pass. There's no exemption. Everybody does it. Now, under that, there are some of us who are gifted as evangelists, and you will spend most of your time doing that. Um, Missionaries would fall under that. There is a a mandate, a responsibility that falls on your shoulders where you do that the majority of your time. But for the just average run-of-the-mill Christian, you'll have a responsibility to, first and foremost, grow in your maturity with Christ, within your church, within your own life, within your own family, but also... Find ways to share what Christ has done in you with this world. 
That's everybody. Nobody's exempt. That's what Paul is trying to get us to understand. So if that's a mandate and it's on all of us, I have a responsibility as a pastor to help equip you in this weird time that we live to fulfill this mission because the message doesn't change. Jesus still was the ransom for our sins. His blood paid the price for our sins. That is still the message. It will always be the message. Without Jesus, you cannot get to God. Without Jesus, you spend eternity in hell. Now the gospel message is that in God's grace, He sent His Son in order to be the stand-in because you can never be righteous enough. So when you stand before God, He doesn't see your righteousness, He sees Christ's. That's the gospel good news. But in this world that we're living in, it's very difficult to talk about that for a couple of different reasons. One of the reasons is that in this world that we live in, we are convinced that what we see here in Tallahassee and in Florida and America is a good representation of what's happening in the rest of the world. And that's not true. There was a Pew study that was done um, in 2016 that shows that four out of every five people in the world say that they have some understanding or belief or conviction that there is a God and that he is in control and all-powerful. That is four out of five people in the entire world. But when you drill down into America, 25% of adults, no matter what the age, say that they have no belief in God whatsoever. And when you start drilling down into the age group and you just account for millennials, which would be people that were born right around 1981 up till about 1996, so they're somewhere in their 20s, 30s, late 30s, 35% of millennials say that they have no association with God whatsoever. They don't think that he is real. They don't think that if he is real, he plays any real part in the world that we live in on a regular basis. And then there's another part of them that just say, well, we don't know. There's not enough information. There's no guarantee. We can't be sure that there is a God. So the Pew study went ahead and took that association, those 35%, and put, created a new category for them because that's what we do as humans. We create categories for people because it's easy for us to figure out who's who based off of whatever you believe. And they gave them a new name. And the group, that group is called the nuns which is funny because immediately you're probably thinking like black and white, N-U-N, not that, N-O-N-E-S, nuns. The reason why they say that is because when they're asked in these studies, what is your view of God? Do you have any religious affiliation? They always mark the box that says none. I have no religious affiliation. So that's where we live. In most of the world, the concept that there is a creator is very real in, in most of the people's minds. But um, almost like over a quarter, um, coming quickly up on a half of at least the 20 to 30 year olds in America operate with the understanding that there is no God. Or if there is, he's not interested in any kind of personal relationship with us. So we have uh, in our mission field where we're meeting on a regular basis, this group of people that represent a large portion of where we live called the nuns. These would be people that would be atheists. They would consider themselves agnostics. They'd be considered people who have no religious affiliation whatsoever. But outside of just the nuns, there's also two other groups of people that you're going to meet in your mission field on a regular basis. The nuns, but also there are the hurt people who have some understanding of the kingdom of God, or maybe they have been involved in church, but they have been hurt in church and they don't want anything to do with church. And so they're hurt and they're not associated with any um, Christian church currently. And then outside of the nuns and the hurt, there's the skeptics. The skeptics are the people who like to pull apart everything and they have a very hard time understanding uh, or, or resting their faith in any religious structure or the idea of a God or the fact that this Bible that we say is true, how can you actually know that it's true? So these three groups represent a large portion of the majority of the people that you will meet in your mission field here in Tallahassee and the surrounding area on your regular basis. 
So you are supposed to be missionaries. You're supposed to live in a missional lifestyle. You're supposed to be thinking about spreading the gospel on a regular basis to people that you work with, people that you, um, you go to, your kids go to school with, uh, people that are your neighbors. And this is a good representation of um, some of the people that you will meet on a regular basis. What I want in this message series is to help you understand their point of view. Because in your maturing up into the stature of Christ, one of the things you're supposed to be do is doing is um, learning how to speak in love and eloquently and honestly about the kingdom of God uh, in a way that is full of compassion uh, and your desire to be able to spread the love of God to these people. And often we don't have those opportunities to learn how to do that, which is one of the reasons why I want to do this. I want to equip you to be able to speak logically and lovingly to the people that God has sent you to. How do we know God sent you here to these people? Because this is where you live. If he had sent you somewhere else, you'd be living somewhere else. Paul tells us in Acts that God has ordained all the times in the history of the world and all the places that everybody lives. So you're here not by chance or by accident. God established you to be at this period of time in this city for this reason. So I want to equip you to be able to talk eloquently and logically and lovingly to the people that God has sent you to. So, in the idea of dealing with skeptics and people who um, are hurt or have no religious affiliation, I want us to constantly remember Romans 2, 4, which says that it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. That is, that's like, that's the salt that I'm going to put on top of this meal, so it's got some seasoning. It's not the main course, but it's the thing that we constantly have to come back and touch on. It is the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. Not your posts on Facebook that lead people to repentance. Okay? Not your snarky comments. Not your bad attitude. Not your um, display of lack of self-control when you were in that store and so rudely said, I want to see the manager because you're not getting your way. None of that stuff leads people to repentance. It is kindness from heaven down here and from here outward that leads people to repentance. Amen? So in every conversation, it's not about being right. In every conversation that you have, especially with a non-believer, it is not about getting them to that point where they finally bow their heads and close their eyes and say that prayer and you've sealed the deal and then you can move on. That's not the goal. The goal is kindness. Because kindness leads to repentance, and repentance is the mark of a Christian. The mark of a Christian is not someone who said some prayer. That's nowhere in the Bible. In the New Testament, saying a prayer is not the mark of, all right, well, now we're Christians. Baptism was the thing that the disciples chose as the turning point for when you say that you're a Christian. Now, I have no problem with walking somebody through a prayer of saying, all right, you're going to confess the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart. I have no problem with confession faith and, and, and having somebody walk through a prayer. But we have lied to ourselves that the end goal is just getting somebody to say those words, and then they're good. That is, that is not a representation of the Christianity that Jesus brought. It's a representation of good tent revivals where we are getting thousands of people to come down, but there's no follow-up on whether they've actually done discipleship process and been converted. And I'm worried that at the end of the age, there's going to be hundreds of thousands of people standing before Jesus saying, but we called you Lord, Lord. I said a prayer. And Jesus is going to look at them and say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. We have a responsibility to not muddy the water and make it confusing for people to understand what it means to be a Christian. One of the cornerstones of it is repentance. I'm turning from where I was to this more beautiful thing called Jesus and his kingdom. And I want to make that clear. And the Bible tells us from Romans that the way that happens is the kindness of God that flows down into us and then out into others. And Kindness comes out in our words and our deeds and how we treat people. Got it? Good. All right. So here's our plan for the series. Today, we're going to discuss the nuns, the hurt. Every time I say nuns, it makes me want to giggle. 
<laughs> we're going to discuss the nuns, the hurt, and the skeptic. Next week, we're going to talk about ways to build relationships and serve our city and love with compassion and uh, show kindness where we live. And then the final two weeks, we're going to walk through a process of answering common questions that have been asked of Christians and giving responses so that you guys can start understanding, all right, I've, I've gotten this question multiple times and I don't know how to answer it. Hopefully we're going to cover some of those things. Cool? That's the purpose of this message series. We're going to go through the end of May and when we start the beginning of June, we're going to jump into the book of Judges. So let's talk about the atheists, the agnostics, and the nuns. First and foremost, let's talk about who they are. The atheists are people that, that would say that there is no God. They have no um, belief in any kind of higher power, that when you die, that's it, that's the end of your story. There, this is Everything we see, that's it. There is no uh, God, there's no spirit, there's no outside influence. What you see is what you get. Agnostics would be people that would say, um, uh, it's not that I don't have no faith, and it's not that I don't believe in God whatsoever. I'm kind of in the middle, and I'm saying that maybe God might be real, but there is no way for humans to be able to know that. That's agnostic. So the atheists are, no, no, there's no God. Agnostics would say, well, we don't really know. I'm not taking a stance on that. There's no way to know that there's not, or there is, and so I'm right here in the middle. And then the nuns would say that these are people who say, look, uh, maybe there is a God, but it is completely irrelevant to me. Religion has no impact on my life. It's irrelevant to where I live and what I'm doing. I don't give it much thought. Um, it's just not a thing that crosses my mind on a regular basis. That's the group that we're talking about. So in that group, um, I thought it would be helpful to talk about one of the largest critiques from that area, from people who say, there's no God, or we're not really sure, or I don't really want anything to do with religion. Um, there's a Pew Research study in 2018 where there's about five or six things uh, based off of percentages that the, this group of people would say are their biggest critiques or issues with Christianity. But I took the top one and we're going to discuss that because it really influences a lot of the other ones. So the biggest critique from this group of people are Christians are too exclusive to people who are different. Have you heard that? I don't want anything to do with Christianity because you guys are too exclusive to people who are not like you. You're not loving enough. You're not welcoming enough. Now, that critique does come from some of our, um, our past, some of which, which I would argue is not actually our past because people who are doing things like murdering others in Jesus' name, they don't actually understand Jesus. And so I, I wouldn't classify them as part of our family, even though other people would like to do that. Um, but people are weak, and all of us, um, as growing as Christians, we make terrible decisions. And so um, I understand the critique that this group of people, and I'm, uh, my apologies for lumping them all in together, but just for the sake of this critique, that they um, would say that we are too exclusive, um, I want to be able to lump these in together. So you see this argument a lot, probably the most right now, from um, the LGBTQ community. That's a, a big area. Um, uh, also people um, that have an issue with the way that Christians get involved uh, in politics or in social areas. This is a big critique. Um, you see this also when people talk about sin. Um, I, don't, I don't understand why I can't be a Christian and do this thing. You guys are just being too exclusive. So what I want to do is walk you through, as a Christian, how do you respond to that critique when you're on the mission field talking to people about Jesus and that question comes up or that critique comes up? Hey, you guys are too exclusive. What do you say to that? Now, I'm going to walk you through Luke 10 real quick, just for our own personal um, sake, but I would not recommend that you would walk somebody through Luke 10, 29, because I think it would be very unhelpful. Because one of the things about um, this group is that from their perspective, the Bible has no authority. So you can't say the Bible says, because they don't care what the Bible says. Does that make sense? So we're going to walk them through a logical argument. And then once they understand the point of view from where we're coming from, then the door is open to be able to talk about why you see the Bible as authoritative. But just coming out and saying, well, the Bible says this, that's not going to be helpful. So let's go to Luke 10, verse 29 real quick. This is the conversation that Jesus is having um, about what a neighbor is. And we would commonly refer to this um, as the Good Samaritan story. 
So Luke 10, 29, verse 37. I'm reading this so that we all have a common understanding of what is required of us as Christians. Not we, what we think a Christian is, but what Jesus says a Christian is. So Luke 10, 29 says this. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? So this guy thinks he's going to get one over on Jesus. And he asked Jesus, all right, you're talking about uh, we're supposed to love our neighbor. Who's our neighbor? And this is what Jesus replies. All right, so a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed and left him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down by that road. And when he saw him, he passed by him on the other side. And likewise, a Levite. But he came to the place and saw him pass by him on the other side. Now, just quick um, side note, the priests and Levites, that was Jesus' way of explaining to us that these were people who should have, excuse me, understood the law of God. The priest, the Levite, the priest being the person who's stewarding God's word and the worship and the Levite is the one who's caring for God's stuff like the box and the tent and the temple. All this. If anybody was supposed to understand what God wanted, it would have been these two and they just walked right past him. So, but a Samaritan, a Samaritan was a person who was um, kind of a mixture. They were half Jewish and half Gentile and they intermarried and they often took um, other gods as their gods and rejected um, God. Uh, the God of Israel. So this Samaritan, this person who everybody was not really um, interested in, as he's journeying, he came to where he was and he saw him and he had compassion. And he went to him and he bound up his wounds and he poured oil and wine on it. And then he sent him on his own animal and brought him to the inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, look, take care of this guy and whatever you, whatever more you spend beyond this, I'll repay you when I come back. Which of these do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus says to this, go and do likewise. So what are we supposed to do as Christians? We're supposed to be like that Samaritan. We're supposed to show mercy. We're supposed to go beyond the, whatever the world would say. This is the least, this is, at least this is the baseline that all humanity we should operate at. Um, Christians should go far beyond that. That's what Jesus is saying. We should stand out because of our mercy and our compassion, not because we shout louder than everybody else. You follow? So Christians should be people who love and care for their neighbors. Neighbors are who? Neighbors are everybody. This is the beauty of it. Neighbors are everybody, meaning Christians and non-Christians. So Christians, according to Jesus, are supposed to treat everybody, whether you're a Christian or not, with the same level of love and mercy and compassion. We treat everybody with love and mercy and compassion, no matter where they are or what they believe. We operate with the same mercy and compassion and love with everybody because everybody is our neighbor. That's the baseline. Get it? Now, the issue that this group takes is not necessarily how we treat uh, Christians, but how we treat non-believers, which is the reason why I wanted to read this. So the, the issue that they bring up is not um, uh, so much of an issue of, of how we're treating people, but that's how we're going to circle back around to it, but it's how we treat people who are outside of the group. And from their point of view, they're saying we are um, too exclusive for letting them become a part of our clubs. We're saying, okay, you, you Christians, you, you, you may be nice and kind to everybody, but if I want to be a part of your club, you're being too exclusive. That's the main argument. You follow? So here's how we're going to break this down. Jesus is setting the boundaries for what a Christian is through most of the book of John and the Gospels. And he makes it very, very explicit that it is exclusive to be a Christian. If you want to be a Christian, it requires great things of your life. So there's no argument there. And I understand how people would have an issue with that. It's too exclusive to become a Christian. Yes, that is true. Jesus has set very specific parameters about what it means to be a Christian and be a part of this group and it's exclusive. You have to do these things if you want to be a part of this group. But here's the thing. Christians are not any more exclusive than any other group in the world. Are you following me? This is how you're going to walk them through the understanding. If the argument is you guys are too exclusive, you admit, you admit yes, we are exclusive, but we are not any more exclusive than any other group in the world. 
Christians are not, we don't have the lock and we're not unique on the idea of being exclusive. Let me give you a case example. So if someone who is a member of a local uh, LGBTQ community, maybe they're on a board or something, and they're heading up the responsibilities of this organization, and they make a decision, they, they come in one board meeting, and he, maybe it's the president, and he stands up and he says, guys, I went to church this past Sunday, and I got saved. And I now believe that homosexuality, homosexuality is a sin and what we're doing is wrong. How long do you think that organization is going to let him stay the president of that local chapter? Not long. Why? Because as inclusive as we think and they think that that organization is, there are boundaries. The idea that there is a thing called um, uh, total inclusivity is a farce. It's not real. You following where I'm going with this? So if we can understand that the, if, if we want the goal to be completely inclusive, no group on planet Earth does that. That's not a thing that we can do. And the reason why it's not a thing that you can do is because the moment that a group loses their boundaries, they lose the identity of being a group. That's the reason why they are a group, because they have boundaries that set them apart from everyone else. And the moment that you ask a group to say, I need you to drop what makes you exclusive, that's no longer an organization. They have lost their identity. You follow where I'm going with this? So what we say when we're talking about this point is, is not that exclusivity is uniquely Christian. Exclusivity is everywhere. And since it's everywhere... We have to be careful, just like any organization, about making sure that the way that people come in and become a part of this family is explicitly clear, and you can understand, whether you're on the inside or the outside, what makes us unique. Just like you understand what would make you unique in this other organization that says they are more inclusive than us, every organization has boundaries on what makes them an organization. So... You're having a conversation with somebody and they're saying you're too exclusive and you've walked them through this process and helped them understand that we're not any more exclusive than anybody else. We're, we're simply another belief structure. We're not any different than anybody else. What you then point them to is if every organization in the world is exclusive, then how do we judge what organization or religion is right? And that's when you bring them back to Luke 10. Judge a group based off of how they treat people who are not part of the organization. And according to Christians, we have a responsibility, whether you're in or out of the family, to treat you with compassion and with love and with respect. And if Christians did that, if that was our mandate and we actually followed it, then that would be something that we can point the world to, and I would encourage you to, Point the world to, don't judge us on how we treat people if they're in or they're out and how they get in, because that's what every organization does. Judge us how we treat those who are not part of the organization. So the argument of Christians are too exclusive boils down to the idea that, yes, we are exclusive, but not so exclusive that we are more exclusive than anyone else. So you can have that argument as a win. You are right, we are exclusive, but don't judge us on our exclusivity. Judge us how we treat those who are not part of the family. And I promise you will not find a group or an organization that is more loving and compassion than Christians if they follow what Jesus told them to do. You tracking with me? Good. Now, keep in mind, I said this earlier, but I feel like it's an important footnote. If you're taking notes, write this down. Keep in mind that for atheists and for agnostics and for the nuns, the Bible holds no authority. You cannot say the Bible says because they don't care what the Bible says. So you can't walk through this process of saying, well, like, I believe this because the Bible says so. It is more helpful when you're talking with these people to walk them through historical facts of things that actually happened. So we're not saying things like the Bible said so. We're saying um, John, who wrote a book about Jesus, he watched Jesus die and then later, just about 10 days later, had breakfast with him on the beach. Not the Bible said so, but Luke, who was not there when Jesus was around, but was a doctor and went around and interviewed all of the eyewitnesses when Jesus was alive and took meticulous notes and submitted his report to the Roman authorities. I'm trusting his eyewitness account 
The same way I would trust somebody who is sitting on a witness stand and I'm in a jury box and I wasn't there at the scene of the crime, but this person was. And so I'm going to trust their word as fact. I'm not saying the Bible says so. I'm trusting the word that Paul, who hated Christians and made it his life journey to kill them, was then converted and spent the rest of his life traveling around the Mediterranean Rim, giving his life up for this cause. I'm, I'm not just trusting that the Bible says so. I'm trusting the fact that historically these 12 guys who followed Jesus for three years at the end of their life, Almost all of them were hung on a cross or burned or fed to lions or killed or martyred in some way. And not one of them, even to save their life, said, I don't believe that Jesus is God. Not one of them turned their back. And I'm not just trusting the fact that the Bible says so. I'm trusting the historical fact that a group of people went against the entire Jewish temple structure and the entire Roman Empire of their time And it has not slowed down one bit to 2019, and it's the reason why we're all sitting in this room today. You follow? So when we're talking about people who struggle with faith and they don't believe in God, that's how you logically walk them through. Christians are not any more exclusive than anybody else. And the reason why we believe what we believe is not just because the Bible said so, is because there's also historical facts that root what the Bible says in history. And so we can take that as fact. Now, let's talk about the hurt. Who are the hurt? The hurt are people who have some church experience, but whatever experience they have, it's full of abuse and they've been taken advantage of in church. People who are hurt are people who have been abused by church leadership or taken advantage of by other people in the church. And they they don't necessarily say, I don't believe in God. What they say is, I don't want any part of his church which is dangerous because Jesus is pretty clear about what the church is supposed to be. It's it's his bride. He cares for the church in a way that a husband should care for his wife. That's how much Jesus loves his church. So when somebody is hurt by the church, we have a responsibility to be able to, to care for them in a unique way because Jesus wants that person back. Does that make sense? So what do they believe? Most of them operate with the belief that all churches are the same And their goal is eventually to hurt them. They rely on their previous experiences and they say, this is what I know. This is what I've experienced. And I'm confident that it's going to continue moving forward. And so I don't want any part of church moving forward. Now, let me walk you over to 1 John 1, 8 through 10. This is how we're going to respond to people who are hurt and how we love them. 1 John 1, 8 through 10 says this, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So when you're talking with somebody who said, nah, I've had enough of church. Churches are full of hypocrites and all they do is hurt me. What do you say? You tell them they're right. Why are they right? Because all of us, according to John, still are working through the process of sin and no one is there yet. You are not going to find a church with people who are not still right in the middle of the discipleship process and sometimes they get it wrong. Not because they're wolves in sheep's clothing, but because they're immature children and they're still growing and they make mistakes. I'm telling you now, as your pastor, if I haven't upset you or made a mistake yet, just give me a little more time. I promise I'm going to get there. Because, because if I say that we're, I don't have sin and I'm not there, and you're going to be fine here, that you're not going to have to find something to just work through and get over and be okay with, then I'm lying to you. We're all right in the middle of our transformation process, which means God is going to put you in a seat right next to somebody who votes differently than you, that thinks differently about you than stuff. Their, their, their finances are different. You, and, and God wants you to get so close to them that you start rubbing together and you both are transformed by it. If you are a part of a church where everybody looks like you, guess what you're going to end up looking like? You. You will never change if all you do is surround yourself with people that look like you. That's not what the early church looks like. That's not what God's church looks like. 
It's full of all kinds of different people who are right in the middle of transformation. But the good news is at the end of the road, when everything is finally done, we will all be like him. Praise God, you will not all be like me, and I will not all be like you. We will all be like him. That's the direction we're going. So when you're talking about somebody who has been hurt in church, let them understand that their hurt is legitimate, and it might not be the last time that they've been hurt, or that they will be hurt. Because in church, there are lots of broken people. And you can actually go a little bit step further um, with maybe a non-believer or somebody who's an agnostic who would say the church is just full of a bunch of hypocrites. You can actually give them the fact that, yes, it is quite possible that you will find non-believers who are nicer, kinder, wiser, better than Christians that you'll find inside the church. Why? Because all of us as Christians are not saved because of our moral superiority. We are actually saved in spite of that, and we stand before God having Jesus as the one who is accounted for our sins. It is very possible to find lots of people out in the world who are nicer and kinder than Christians. Why? Because we're not Christians because we're nice and kind. We're Christians because he saved us when we were not nice and kind. And that's the good news. That one day we will move into a place where we will mature and we will be more like him. And the goal is to be kind and nice. But that's not the definition of what it means to be a Christian. We're not just nice people. We reflect the glory of God and we are kind because we have been transformed. But that's not the thing that makes us Christians. It is a byproduct of being Christians. But you can find it outside in the world too. So, what do you do when you're talking with somebody who's been hurt and you've uh, acknowledged the fact that um, in, in, in all churches there are broken people? You remind them that even though all churches are full of broken people, not all churches hurt people. Don't promise them that they won't get hurt in church. Promise them that not all churches will hurt people. That not all churches are like the way that you've experienced. And the best way to confirm this is by showing it, not just saying it. Because in the same way that it's not helpful to tell an agnostic the Bible says so because they don't really believe the Bible anyway has any authority in their lives, you can't just say to someone who's been hurt, you're going to be okay. You have to show them that they're going to be okay. You have to meet their needs. You have to find a way to help them experience Christ you have to find out what was, ha- what was done to them, and you do the complete opposite. That's how you love someone who has been hurt. You find ways to serve them and love them and care for them. Now, let's, this is our third one. Let's talk about the skeptics. So who are the skeptics? Skeptics are people who don't trust anything because they've been jaded by life. These are people who, um, through maybe social media or through fake news or conspiracy theories or maybe crooked pastors or bad experiences in churches, their worldview has been shaped about God and the church, and they don't trust you or me or church. They may, uh, they may be okay like coming with their spouse or showing up every now and then, but uh, a- as a rule, they just kind of, they, they look through like, eh, I see what you're doing there. You're not really doing that because of that. You're doing it for that. And I get it. I understand why it can be skeptic because if you watch five minutes of Christian television, most Christians will walk away a skeptic. Right? Because the goal doesn't seem to be growing and maturing in Christ. It seems to be, please write me a check. I get it. I understand why the world is full of skeptics. I do. But in their skepticism, they believe that they can't trust church and they can't trust God. So how do you handle someone who is a skeptic? Well, first and foremost, you acknowledge that being a skeptic is okay. There is nothing wrong with being a skeptic and asking questions. Let me go to Acts 17, verse 10 through 20. This is on one of Paul's missionary journeys. He goes into a town called Berea, and he preaches the gospel to these Bereans, and their response is not, whoa, all right. All of them go home and study what Paul said and then come back later the next day with a, with a um, well-thought-out response to whatever Paul said. This is um, Acts 17, 10 through 12. The brothers immediately after Paul and Silas had preached to them, um, uh, excuse me, the brothers immediately, saw, uh, saw Paul and Silas went to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue and they started preaching. 
Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness. They were real excited about what they had to say, but they examined the scriptures daily to see if what they were saying was true. There's nothing wrong with being a skeptic. There's no, nothing wrong with asking questions. There's nothing wrong with listening to me preach and then saying, I don't know if that's true or not. I'm going to go home and read it for myself. Good. That is the best thing you possibly can. Never take something I say as, well, he said it. Who am I? I'm a nobody. I'm just a dude who shows up on Sunday and preaches this word. I have no authority in your life. Who has authority in your life? Jesus has authority in your life. If he says it, then you can take it to the bank. What do we judge what we've heard against? The Bible. The historical record of people who were living 2,000 years before we ever showed up on the scene. So it is a good thing to be skeptical. It is a great thing to hear something and then go back and check it to see whether it's true or not. Jesus did the same thing with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Nicodemus shows up in the middle of the night. He's got a bunch of questions. And Jesus doesn't look at him and say, man, I'm Jesus. How dare you ask me questions? Look at me. I'm God in flesh and blood. Who do you think you are asking me questions? That's not what he does. <clears throat> he sits there and he has a conversation with Nicodemus and he explains to Nicodemus about being born again. And it blows his mind, but he has conversations with him and he explains things and he expounds upon stuff. The problem with being a skeptic is not being a skeptic, it's being too skeptical of everything. And that's what you have to walk a skeptic to. There's nothing wrong in the kingdom of God of being skeptical about some of this stuff, but if everything in your life, your desire is to see through it, then you never actually see anything in your life. <coughs> because my end goal is, I'm going to see through your facade, you might actually miss me. You might actually, you, you might rob yourself of a really good friendship with me if you're spending all of your time trying to see through me. If you see through everything, you don't see anything. And that's what you have to explain to a skeptic. At some point, you can never really know what anybody thinks or feels. You never really, 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 really know with 100% certainty what somebody thinks. At some point in every relationship in our life, we go off of some amount of faith where we just trust the experiences that we had with this other person and we just assume that what they're telling us is true. And when we do that, we give ourselves the ability to enjoy friendship and community with people. There's a blessing, there's a joy in doing that. But if you're spending all of your time being convinced that everyone's trying to take from you and you're trying to see through their game, then you never get the opportunity to experience that joy. You rob yourself of it. Now, you can be skeptical at God and of the church, but you have to at some point walk to the process of looking at what it is that they say they believe and examining the fruit of it. If you can't trust what I say, then look at the way that I live. Because I may be able to lie to you, but my life cannot lie to you. At some point, there's either fruit on the tree or there's not fruit on the tree. And you can see from a distance, well, maybe he taped that fruit on the tree and it's plastic fruit. How do you know if it's, if it's real fruit? You've got to get close and you've got to examine and you've got to pick some of that fruit. So when you're talking with people who are skeptical, how do you walk them through? In our mission field, how do you walk them through a process of, of embracing the idea of coming to church and accepting Jesus and, and, and what his work is? How do you do that? You allow your life to be positioned in a way where people can get close to you and examine the fruit of what it is you believe. That's how you minister to the skeptic. You live your life so open and so available and so free that any time they want to examine whether what you're saying is true, they can come and they can have a meal with your family and they can pick the fruit and examine because there's one thing you can't lie about and that's how delicious that fruit of the Spirit is. So, let's wrap it up with this. I said previously that the Bible doesn't hold authority for a lot of people. And so what we have to do is we have to show people what happens when you apply the Bible. 
you've got to be able to meet their needs. You've got to be available to build relationships with people. You've got to show them historical facts. There was a time in America where you could just say, thus saith the Lord, and you either believed it or you didn't. But so many people have said, thus saith the Lord, when the Lord did not say thus, and it has ruined it for all of us. And so now we live in a post-Christian age where people say, I don't need what you're selling because I can get a happy life outside of what you're selling. The problem is the end goal is not a happy life. The end goal is a happy eternity. And all of us will be accounted. There will be a time where we will stand before God and all debts will be settled. And I promise you, if you don't have the wealth of Jesus in your account, you will come up short. So, all of these things, obviously, they do not take the place of the working of the Holy Spirit. That is a given. The Holy Spirit is working in the hearts of people all around us. And when He prompts you to go talk to somebody, whether they're um, a nun or whether they're um, hurt or whether they're a skeptic, you know by faith that God has already started something inside their heart. And by faith, you step out and don't be afraid about what you're going to say. But now you have some tools that you can use to help answer some of the questions that I know you will get on the mission field. But do not forget that what we're doing in this work of missions is going to work with our dad. He's doing this work, whether you choose to obey or not. He's calling people from the four corners of the earth. And He desires for you to go to work with Him and for you to take up the mantle and respond and say, God, you're calling Him? Use me. Let me tell Him about your kingdom. That's what evangelism looks like. Us partnering with the work that God is already doing. And I want that for you. So as we leave today, my prayer is that you use these tools to do God's work, but also you season your life with prayer. God, use me. Amen? Let's pray.